Howdy folks, Jabberiki here, and it's time for me to continue Puppet Panic Season of Chucky as I do a double bill review of Bride of Chucky and Seed of Chucky. Chucky's ex-girlfriend Tiffany decides to stitch together Chuck's good guy doll and performs a voodoo spell to revive the serial killer's soul into his plastic body. Tiffany assumes that Chucky was going to propose to her before he died, but she is mistaken. She decides to case Charles as punishment for mocking her misunderstanding and not taking marriage seriously. Angered by Tiff, Chucky breaks from his playpen, kills Tiffany in her bath, and sends her soul into her own doll. Tiffany is greatly upset by this change, but Chucky explains that there's an amulet that's hanging around his own corpse that can help them become human again. So Tiffany pays her teenage neighbor Jesse to drive the dolls to the cemetery where Chucky was buried, and Jesse decides to use the money to pay for a wedding with his girlfriend Jade. But along their road trip, Jade's overprotective sleazy uncle, who is the chief of police, is using his connections to split the couple apart, so Chucky and Tiffany kill anyone in their way. Authorities suspect Jesse and Jade themselves as the killers, while the two lovers are actually afraid that the other is the murderer, all while Chucky and Tiffany fall in love all over again while enjoying slaying lives together. While the Charles Play movies did sometimes have a sense of humor, this movie is a full-on black comedy satire, a tongue-in-cheek farce that puts laughs before scares. So how, how did you end up like this? Well, it's a long story. It sure is. In fact, if it was a movie, it would take three or four sequels just to do it justice. With the Charles Play films getting sillier and dumber each installment, I think that Bride of Chucky shamelessly embracing the ridiculousness of the Chucky premise is a great idea and a fantastic change of pace. I mean, it's a breath of fresh air to not have yet another movie about Chucky trying to possess a child, with the goal this time being an amulet. Sure, it inspires a basic A to B road trip movie story, but the film uses its simple template to focus on the heart of Chucky, his love for killing people, and the joy he gets from being a serial murderer. But the real shakeup comes from the introduction of Tiffany, because now Chucky has a partner in crime. Someone to not only murder victims with, but also bounce off of. These two have a lot of hilarious banter together. For God's sake, Chucky, drag yourself into the 90s. Stabbings went out with Bundy and Dahmer. You look like Martha Stewart with that thing. Who the fuck is Martha Stewart? With the film somehow finding an endearing charm to the relationship between two killer dolls. Tiffany herself is not just a female doppelganger of Chucky, but very much her own character. Sure, she loves to kill people just like Charles, but she's a lot more sensitive than him. Even though she revels in bloodshed, she really wants to be loved and dreams of having a traditional wedding. Yes, she's a violent murderer with no mercy, but we kind of feel sorry for how Chucky underappreciates her, and it takes a lot to get audiences to sympathize with a villain like Tiffany. Maybe it's because she's the lesser of the two evils showing more heart compared to Charles. Plus, there's no denying how much self-confidence she has. She's someone who owns her independence, loves being who she is, and knows that she's a gorgeous woman. Plus, it helps that the amazing Jennifer Tilly provides Tiffany's voice. She nails the complicated personality of this demented serial killer, sounding devious and unhinged, but also sexy and sultry. Uh. What are you doing? Ah! What would Martha Stewart say? Fuck Martha Stewart! Martha Stewart can kiss my shiny plastic butt! While also sounding very fragile for her more emotional moments. I love you, Chucky. I know. We belong together. It's actually her charming personality that endears the bad-tempered Chucky, bring out a soft side to him that we never saw in the Child's Play movies. Tiff. I'm sorry for everything. Thus adding rich, multifaceted dimension to Chucky as a villain. I also have to say that it's darkly hilarious seeing a pair of killer dolls playing house, with Tiffany trying to keep the illusion up, while Charles mainly enjoys the merits of a wife looking after him. But let's not forget that this film features human characters too, as easy it is to disregard that they even exist in this film, because neither have any kind of defined personality. They're certainly nice, likeable people, and I prefer them to your usual horror movie teen stereotypes, 
but there's nothing interesting about these two, and their actors aren't charismatic enough to compensate for their blandness. Marry me. Tonight. Warren would kill us. I don't care about Warren. That's why we're gonna disappear. Where are we gonna go? Anywhere you want. Well, what are we gonna do for money? I got money. Where did you get However, the film does make great use out of these two, not only giving them the important duty of driving the dolls to their destination, but also letting the murders happening around them test their relationship, even pushing them both to maybe distrust the other. Where were you? Is that all you have to say? What do you want me to say? Well, I should think you'd have something to say about what happened. Oh, I, I got something to say. I think you're fucking crazy. I'm crazy. You say you'll do anything for me and this is what I get? Teenage love is often full of naivety and innocence, so it's fun to see how making these two murder suspects challenges the strength of their romance, with the two of them getting annoyed at each other for jumping to such a conclusion. Writer Don Mancini based the film on classic rom-coms focused on couples' misunderstandings, adapting a formula from the innocent golden age of screwball movies into the world of grotesque horror is actually quite funny in a grim sort of way. I love you. I will always love you, but there is a limit to how much I can take. Would you please stop talking to me like I'm the one who's crazy? You're the crazy one! You're the mass murderer! You mean multiple murderers! So you admit it! No, I don't! I can't take this shit anymore! The only person they can both totally trust is their friend David, who I will admit is the most likable human character in the film, being the only one with his head screwed on tight, but also eager to support his friend's forbidden relationship. Anyway. The thing that struck me was how sure you both sounded. And to me, that meant one of three things. One of you is lying, both of you are wacko, or both of you are wrong. Add to that the fact that I know you both better than anybody else, and I've never seen either of you so much as hurt a fly, and I've concluded that what we have here is a terrible misunderstanding. This is what makes his own eventual suspicion of the two so funny. He suddenly goes from being the calm, sensible one to a panicking mess willing to point a gun at his mates. And while his death is quite hilariously silly, I was disappointed to see him go. The movie's finale is where everything comes full circle. Jade and Jesse outwit Chucky and Tiffany by riling up an argument between the two, and Jade manages to push Tiffany into the cooker burning her, but not killing her. Everyone finally reaches the cemetery. Chucky has Jade at gunpoint, and Jesse has Tiff at gunpoint. The two men make the deal of trading over nice and slowly. Seeing Tiffany walking with painful burns is quite disturbing and slightly sad, even though she's no angel herself. However, Tiff then sees how much Jesse loves Jade, becomes self-conscious of how toxic a relationship with Chucky is, and insecure about not having a normal love life. To the point where she's willing to sacrifice herself. Not only believing that she and Chucky aren't meant to be, but also don't deserve to live. Chucky, look at us. Don't you see? We belong dead. Goodbye, darling. I'll see you in hell. <sighs> It's quite a strong character development, one that makes sense too, as Tiffany has always been conflicted between her love of murder and desire for normality. So what about the puppetry? Well, with the killer dolls being the main stars this time, the puppetry gets a much bigger focus. And while these two spend a lot of their screen time sat in the back of a car, there are scenes that push their puppets to do something tricky, from Chucky getting a one knee to propose, to Tiffany carefully applying her makeup. Director Ronnie Hugh had worked with animatronics before on the critically panned martial arts fantasy film Warriors of Virtue. But to be fair, you can tell that he had improved as a puppet filmmaker by this point. He understood what animatronics could do at the time and blocked shots as cinematically as he could, in spite of the limitations given. Heck, this has some of the best puppetry shots I've seen so far in the franchise. To conclude, Bride of Chucky is a cool revamp of a franchise that had run itself dry. A punk rock black comedy with its tongue firmly in its cheek. It may not have the Chucky film's usual chills or terror, but it's undoubtedly good fun. 
At the end of Bride of Chucky, Tiffany gave birth to her and Chucky's baby. Years later, their child is working as a ventriloquist doll for an abusive carny, who nicknames the kid Shitface. Meanwhile, Hollywood is making a movie on the Chucky saga, starring Jennifer Tilly as Tiffany, and Shitface realizes that the dolls are their parents. So they escape the carny and head off to Hollywood. Once on the movie set, Shitface resurrects their mum and dad, delighted to finally discover their roots, but are pulled to learn that Chucky and Tiffany are serial killers. Chucky insists that their kid is a boy and names him Glenn, but Tiffany sees their child as their daughter and calls her Glenda. Tiffany then decides to stalk Jennifer Tilly, hatching a plan to impregnate the actress with Chucky's sperm in a bit to give her doll family human bodies to transfer their souls over to. All while Tilly is trying to seduce rapper Redman, so that he'll cast her in his new Virgin Mary movie that he's planning to direct. Seed of Chucky doesn't really have much of a story, with a lot of the movie asking characters to just wait around until Jennifer Tilly gives birth. Until the baby comes, the movie does have a bunch of side plots, but I wouldn't say that the film melds them together smoothly. It's a film that has many things to say, sure, but it doesn't know how to click it all together. Wanting to follow the child's play tradition of killer doll murders, while also tackling family drama conflicts and mocking the sleazy side of LA culture. However, in the middle of all of this directionless padding and filler are some interesting themes to analyse. For example, the film explores how having serial killer parents can affect a child's mental health. Glenn or Glenda are not only highly disturbed by each murder they witness, but are also contemplating who they even are. Are they destined to become the next Chucky, or can the Rays become a normal family unit? Am I going to be a killer? Of course, it's been a family tradition for generations. But violence is bad, isn't it? They said so on TV. Not violence. Violins. Violins are bad. That screechy music's gonna ruin the goddamn country. Chucky, Glenda's right. It's time we owned up to it. We have a problem with killing. I don't have a problem with killing. As the movie goes along, Glenn or Glenda develops a twitch, which means that they are slowly losing their sanity. They are being raised in a family that normalizes bloodshed, but are also being told by their parents who they are, never being granted the freedom to find out themselves. A big part of their journey is working out which gender they identify as, with Chucky insisting that they are a boy and Tiffany adamant that they're a girl. I do like how the film explores gender identity with Glenn or Glenda not even being worried which label they are, but rather just happy to find out in their own time. I'd also like how Tiffany is the more open-minded one, contrasting against her husband's conservative values. While she does really want to have a daughter, she eventually listens to her kid, even supporting the idea that her offspring could be gender fluid. Sometimes I feel like a boy. Sometimes I feel like a girl. <gasps> Can I be both? Well, some people... No way. It's the bad-tempered Chucky that shuns them for wanting to be anything but a boy, with Glenn or Glenda being pressured to become a serial killer by their dad and their parents fighting to decide their gender, it's no surprise that Glenn or Glenda's minds start to split. I don't think the film is relating gender fluidity with multiple personality disorder, although I can see audiences making that assumption, but rather how the intense parental pressures and traumatic experiences have twisted and warped this poor child's self-perspective. Can I also just say that Billy Boyd is fantastic as Glenn or Glenda, capturing their demented side and their soft side so well. I'm a real lady killer, if you catch my drift. We'll deal with it together, as a family. Okay, okay, son. What, what, what's happening? Well, now that we've seen a cisgendered man talk about Seed of Chucky, I guess we'd want some sort of transgender perspective on it, right? Well, don't worry. That's why I'm here. As a transgender person, Seed of Chucky has a warm, albeit strange, place in my heart. This is one of the first instances of a non-binary character in media I had ever seen. And of course it ended up being a doll, huh? We can see from Tiffany and Chucky's argument on their child's gender that for a queer person, our first realization of gender and how it may or may not line up with our minds is first reflected by our parents and how they want us to be seen. Chucky insists they have a boy, Tiffany insists they have a girl, and the child himself is not really sure. 
and because they're a doll they got no junk <laughs> so Chucky and Tiffany have the wild idea to impregnate actress Jennifer Tilly with Chucky sperm using a turkey baster and oh my god I'm really talking about this right now Chucky and Tiffany named their child Glenn for a boy or Glenda for a girl an obvious nod to Ed Wood's 1953 infamous movie Glenn or Glenda, one of Hollywood's first attempts to discuss cross-dressing and transsexuality. Glenn or Glenda themselves appears to possess a bit of both traits. Tiffany points out that some people choose not to live as either binary because such a binary doesn't match up with who they are. Chucky, of course, rejects this idea, which causes a final confrontation between Glenn or Glenda where they figuratively and literally dismantle Chucky's toxically masculine worldview by chopping off all of his limbs with an axe. Director Don Mancini, who has written every entry thus far, and himself as an openly gay man, brings a level of gentleness and sensitivity to the transgender community while still keeping in the cheap thrills, bad jokes, and rampant amounts of gore most people expect from a modern Chucky movie. There is a genuine sense of compassion towards Glenn or Glenda, and we can see that just like most transgender children, Glenn or Glenda is more concerned with earning their parents' love rather than pure gender identification. Can she be the sweet girl that Tiffany wants? Can he be the manly murderer Chucky wants? In the end, are they a combination of the two? The fear of living up to parental expectations mixed with uncertainty is something most trans and gay youth have to deal with. The belief that being your authentic self will lose you your parents' love, or that society itself will abandon you merely for your identity. This film isn't a masterpiece of queer cinema or anything, it's still as trashy as it can be, but it does attempt to deal with what society deemed a taboo subject and gives it a bit of understanding and authenticity to it in a way that only a Chucky movie can. What am I? If you want to check out Amori's own videos, then head over to his YouTube channel. He specializes in true creepy stories and horror-related content. He deserves way more attention. Tiffany may be once again the lesser of two evils, but even she is struggling to change, which mainly results in amusing gags where she tries to apply addiction therapy to her serial killing. Recovery hotline? Yes, I'm in recovery, and I'm afraid I'm going to have a slip. Can't get to a meeting. No, it's really not an option. I just freak everybody out. Chucky, on the other hand, is interested in the idea of having a family, but mainly as an excuse to narcissistically carry on his tradition of murder, insisting that his seed takes the torch. By the end, Chuckster is fed up of Tiffany's plan and abandons any desire to become human again, going as far as embracing his killer doll persona, a huge deal for his character as he spent the first four films trying to escape his plastic body. And it's his big speech here that helps cement Chucky as one of my favorite horror villains. As a doll, I'm fucking infamous. I'm one of the most notorious slashers in history. And I don't want to give that up. I am Chucky, the killer doll. And I dig it. Seed of Chucky is also a biting satire of Hollywood culture's vapid shallowness. It's definitely the most film conscious and self aware of the Chucky films so far. This is a portrayal of Hollywood that aims to poke fun at its phony side, with a lot of the sets looking like obvious sound stages, almost like being a movie star is a facade. There's a fakeness to everything we see, an almost dreamlike fantasy take on Beverly Hills. However, I'll admit that the movie is a bit too heavy handed with its parody of LA culture, having characters constantly drawing attention to movie star desperation and how directors take advantage of their need for relevance or recognition. Look, Mel Gibson ain't the only one guy's been talking to in Hollywood, and he personally told me that you was my virgin. While I do applaud Jennifer Tilly and Red Man for being good sports about poking fun at themselves, the joke that celebrities can be shallow gets tired very quickly. I hate to break it to you, but I can't hire you if you're pregnant. That's ridiculous. 
The character's pregnant. Yeah, I know, but I have a very specific vision of Mary. And what can I say? She gots to be hot. I mean, the movie is far from subtle about its jabs at the seedy side of Hollywood, plus I find the whole slut-shaming of Jennifer Tilly to be unnecessary and preachy. But don't you see how evil this is? I don't want to hear it. You're prostituting yourself so you can play the Virgin Mary. Joan, I don't want to hear it. Oh, this is so evil. Even though this film often struggles to tie together its hodgepodge of random themes, it does manage to somewhat connect the Hollywood satire and killer doll family aspects together in the ending. Let me explain. After Jennifer Tilly gives birth to twin children and Chucky refuses to perform the voodoo spell, Tiffany takes their kid and leaves. Plus, Jennifer Tilly is moved to a local hospital. Unfortunately for Tilly, Tiff is here to transfer her family's souls. Charles tracks them down in Jennifer Tilly's hospital room and axes Tiffany. This breaks the young kid's heart and they chop up their father who takes a twisted pleasure from seeing their own child finally embrace murder, despite him being the victim. Then we cut to Jennifer Tilly raising a twin children of Glenn and Glenda, but something starts to not seem right, as it becomes obviously clear that the twins are embodying the dual personalities we've seen in previous scenes. Then it all makes sense. Tiffany succeeded in transferring her and her children's souls into Tilly's family. While not exactly nuanced, it's a clever way of deconstructing the facade of celebrity families who try too hard to seem perfect. How wealth and privilege don't change Tiffany's relentless need to murder. It's a shame that the film takes this long to link together two of its most important thematic aspects. Now, I know that a large fraction of the hardcore Chucky fanbase dislike this movie because it forgets its horror roots and goes for a far more campy and comedic take on the franchise. Personally, I don't mind this film going in such a direction, with the Charles Play films getting unintentionally sillier each installment, and Bride of Chucky paving the way for a more self-aware angle to these films. Seed of Chucky's lack of serious terror and stronger emphasis on humor doesn't really bother me, because it seems like it was the natural step for the franchise to take at this point. I find a lot of the comedy to be pretty laugh out loud funny. Sure, it's not as quotable as Bride of Chucky, but I giggled and chuckled at a lot of the tongue in cheek jokes or pop culture references. <laughs> I can't think of a thing to say. Fuck it. It's entertaining seeing Chucky have more fun with itself and realize how goofy its premise really is. Also, as an effeminate bisexual man, the charm of this film's unapologetic queer campiness really connects with me. It's a very LGBT plus positive film that taps into my community's love of satirical melodrama and tacky B-movie horror, even giving us a great extended cameo from gay icon John Waters. So, what about the puppetry? The killer dolls are the center stage of this film, having even more screen time than any of the live action actors. So we get to see how 21st century technology can help this movie. While a lot of the shots are simply the dolls standing around talking, these puppets are at their most flexible and animated so far, showing how far animatronics have come since the 80s. Plus there's far more experimenting with the organic nature of the dolls, like seeing Tiffany's intricate insides, or showing Glenda crying authentic tears. To conclude, Seed of Chucky may have a paper-thin storyline to work with and can't decide on what it wants to really be about, all while milking its one-dimensional jokes about Hollywood celebrities dry. But I can't deny how entertaining it can be as a campy comedy farce. Plus, it tackles a few of its selected subjects pretty decently, especially gender fluidity and toxic family abuse. It's a strange movie and quite baffling that it even exists, but I think that the Child's Play films needed to get a bit weird and out there after going stale. So those are my thoughts on these two particular Chucky movies. I've been Jambariki and I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, then feel free to like, subscribe and share. Also, please consider supporting me by making a monthly pledge to my Patreon in return for awesome rewards. Thank you. In the next episode of Puppet Panic, Season of Chucky will continue as I review the next installments in the franchise. Cheerio, folks.